Welcome to Smart in the City, the Babel podcast where we bring together top actors in the smart city arena, sparking dialogues and interactions around the stakeholders and themes most prevalent for today's citizens and tomorrow's generations. I am your host, Tamlin Shimizu, and I hope you will enjoy this episode and gain knowledge and connections to accelerate the change for a better urban life. Smart in the City is brought to you by Babel Smart Cities. We enable processes from research and strategy development to co-creation and implementation. To learn more about us, please visit the Babel platform at babel-smartcities.eu. So today we're diving into a really fascinating discussion centered on Venice, the city of Venice, um, a city renowned, of course, for rich history, unique urban environment, um, and now its role in the Toyota Mobility Foundation Sustainable Cities Challenge. So um, together with Detroit and Varanasi, Ven- Venice has been selected as a host city for this global initiative, and um, it's all about low carbon transport solutions. So with me today to tell you all about this, because I also don't know enough and I'm excited to dig into into it and learn a lot more. Um, of course, we have a couple of great guests for you. So we have uh, with us from the city of Venice, Paola Ravenna. Um, she is the director of European Policies and Projects for the city of Venice. Welcome, Paola. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to have you here. I'm really excited to hear more about Venice. Um, and also with her today, we have Andy Fuchs, the general manager of Toyota Mobility Foundation in Europe. Welcome, Andy. Hi, thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Um, so to get warmed up and into the flow of things, I like to start off with a bit of a teaser question. Um, to uh, So here's a fun question for you both. <laughs> um, so first, maybe to you, Andy, if the Toyota Mobility Foundation were a mode of transport, so a bike, a train, a car, whatever you want to call it, what would it be and why? That's a tricky question because I think we wouldn't be any of that. We would be rather the platform because that's what we try to do to bring together various players, exactly all what you mean, all these moods to build a better mobility for all that is inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. Yeah, very good. So you're like a mobility hub, right? (laughs) Yes, in a way. Okay. Yeah. If you if you had to, you know, bringing it all together, um, multimodal transport system, <laughs> we'll go with then. Um, good, Paula. If you had to choose, well, if uh, the city of Venice were a mode of transport, what would it be and why? Uh, of course, uh, because I live also in the historical center of Venice, the first uh, will be a boat. <laughs> Talking about Venice. Uh, even if the shape of the island is a fish, but um, anyway, it's uh, uh, Venice. Uh, uh, we consider, uh, in general, most, most of the people consider Venice uh, the historical uh, island in the middle of the water, but it's uh, in fact uh, included the mainland. So the the modal transport of Venice is an intermodal transport uh, together with the connection uh, with the water and so the boat uh, and the mainland uh, where we want to develop more the use of uh, bike lines or biking. Yeah, very good. I I like boats. So yeah, I like that answer. <laughs> um, so I also want to get to know you as people before we start digging into, you know, everything about the um, the challenge and all of this that's going on. So maybe Paola, you could start with telling us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? What's your background? How did you end up in your role today? Okay. Uh, I'm, I, I, as I said, I come from Venice. I, I was born and grew up in Venice. And, uh, um, and my background is business economics. I have been studying in Venice in Ca' Foscari University. But then I had uh, the opportunity to, um, to, um, to do a master course in Rotterdam. So my, I have to say that my actual, uh, um, competencies, uh, on my job come from this master course that was management of European metropolitan regions. 
So uh, the, I, I, um, I'll, I have learned how to manage a territory, uh, taking account uh, the environment uh, point of view, uh, the uh, social inclusion point of view, and then development of the area. Uh, I started my career in uh, working um, uh, for the municipality of Venice, for chance as always uh, in my life. And my idea was to work uh, for the big um, distribution of food for the supermarket. Uh, but then I, I really enjoyed to work uh, for the, in order to improve the quality of life of citizens, of cities, to, uh, to improve the quality of public services for um, a multitude, for all the citizens stand of uh, only one entrepreneur. So I decided to continue in the municipality, and um, and uh, my my job starting from the because I graduated in business economics from accounting to management control, and then uh, since two thousand eight, uh, after this master course, uh, I started with the uh, implementation of sustainable urban uh, uh, strategies and uh, using the European funds. So the European cohesion policy in the different uh, way um, uh, give me the opportunity to develop a project together with the colleagues from the other departments, like in the case of sustainable mobility and implementing uh, and re reporting uh, in, uh, in uh, a European, I have to say, uh, uh, perspective, exchanging with other cities, uh, research institutes, uh, universities. Um, very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, really interesting work and interesting background. Thank you so, so much for sharing. Um, Andy, to you, tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What are you doing? What's your goal in life? What, Whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> well, uh, born in Germany and went to university as well, where I had my master's degree. But then pretty much during the university times, I already came in touch uh, with the automotive industry and that never left me. So I'm 30 years plus in the automotive industry in various functions around the globe, from Germany to Argentina and back, I would almost say, um, from uh, sales, marketing, uh, motorsports, being involved in Formula One. And then this opportunity came up to join the Toyota Mobility Foundation as a nonprofit foundation of the Toyota Group, where um, I now landed. What I've seen in all these years, and this made it so attractive to switch and to go to the foundation, is the tremendous success of the vehicle, because it's really a success story. If you look back uh, when we were young, there were, well, every family had one car. Today, every member has a car. And uh, one could say, wow, that's quite a story. But on the other hand, uh, if we're now discussing about a transition, it cannot only be a transition towards um, decarbonized vehicles. We have to look also how we have a model shift. Because this is our cities, like, like Venice, they're not built uh, for, for mountains of cars or any other cities that are old, particularly in Europe. And this makes it so interesting uh, to work now in this area and to address these issues that are so burning these days. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love your story as well. So thank you for sharing. Um, Andy, I want to ask you a little bit more. You've you've talked a bit about Toyota Mobility Foundation, but can you elaborate on the mission in Venice and how what what's going on with this challenge? What what is it? Uh, maybe first to give a quick view, because uh, what is Toyota Mobility Foundation? If you carry the name Toyota, you don't normally don't have to introduce yourself, but. We are the non-profit part uh, of this big organization. So we're relatively small. We're about 40 people around the globe. So we have our offices, head offices in, in Tokyo, but in Bangkok, uh, Brussels, Berlin, Plano, and Washington. And we're addressing issues that are not part of the group because we receive our funding from our motor, Toyota Motor Corporation. But we're looking really how we can build a sustainable mobility for the future that is also inclusive and resilient and is looking at various touch points, working together with partners. And that brings us to this challenge because therefore we're working like with Venice, like with other cities and regions, because no one of us can address the issues of today alone. We have to work, uh, work together with partners, and that's what we try to do. So we are, we're looking in finding the right partners. We're financing them towards a shift to a more inclusive uh, mobility for everyone in the future. 
Yeah, really interesting. So, um, Paola, can you tell us why Venice is part of this? What What are your goals? What What are you What are you doing together with Toyota Mobility Foundation? Um, so we are so starting from uh, uh, I have to say ancient time of uh, try to make uh, the mobility more sustainable in the city. We took some um, initiative, investment uh, policies, uh, campaign uh, uh, to people, but at the end. Uh, Briefly, we we are not satisfied about the result. Especially, we 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 didn't reach our uh, target goals in uh, uh, um, shifting from the private from the huge use of private car. Maybe because we are Italians, you know, <laughs> we are passionate about cars. Uh, to, towards the use of a more sustainable um, a mobility uh, model like uh, biking or even local public transportation and uh, um, uh, sharing mobility. So uh, we want really to gather uh, through uh, the Toyota Foundation to uh, look for innovators and try to change the behavior of people. We started with an investment, a huge investment, like uh, realizing kilometers uh, of uh, uh, bike lines, but uh, it, the number of cyclists didn't increase as much as we expected. We involved schools uh, with students, uh, uh, the teacher and parents in order to uh, make them uh, awareness about uh, uh, the change that we have to make in order to reduce uh, uh, the pollution in order to reduce the traffic, in order to make the, uh, the roads uh, more safer uh, for them, in order they can walk or cycle to go to school. And uh, together with Toyota, we wanted to, uh, to find a way to change behavior, to shift. A big undertaking, right? Shifting behavior. Um, this is this is a a frustrating, a, a big topic, right? Whenever you talk about mobility, it's very very difficult to change behavior. So, um, what what is really facing you? Like, what are the challenges that you're having when you're faced with this with these behavior changes? What what are you seeing? The reluctance from people. Explain a little bit about that. Um, I think uh, we, uh, because uh, as I said, we try to organize uh, initiatives, campaign, uh, uh, communication campaigns on, I think we have to start more from, uh, uh maybe starting again to analyze needs of uh, the residents, the city user, visitors, um, because you have to take in account about visitors that uh, in Venice, uh, we have uh, every year uh, 30 million of presence, um, as you know, about considering tourists, but not, all, not only tourists, but also visitors, uh, for example, the academic uh, uh, sector in uh, attract people. Uh, we, we work on, um, a lot in Venice uh, on uh, um, uh, fragile of the environment, so people coming for studying, um, everything's related to high tide and so on. So um, we need to better understand the needs of people uh, moving from uh, one part of the city to another part, and then uh, starting from that, to try to, um, I, I think it's the, the right um, what is nudging to convince people, not forcing, <laughs> because uh, we try doing forcing with rules, uh, regulation, and so on, but convincing them, uh, but offering something that they need. So we have to start from needs. Yeah, that's a really good point, uh, Andy. What's what's your perspective on you know focusing on behavior change? Do you think that this is? Um, you know, that that should be the main focus? Should we be focusing on other regulations? What are What is your perspective on it? I totally agree with uh, what Paola just said. We need to change behavior and there are different ways. And for changing behavior, you need also technology and the right product. So end of the day, both comes together in a way. If you don't have a solution that is superior to what you have today, then it's a problem to change behavior because people might find always a reason to not change because change is nothing humans like to do. 
And we have learned since childhood, the most convenient thing is to jump in the car, turn on the radio and shoot into the city. But these days have changed, but our behavior is still the same. So this is what we want to investigate and develop together with partners and, and here particularly the city of Venice who have invested already so much in an infrastructure that is existing, in bike sharing, in car sharing, in a, in a public transport system that is already to a big degree decarbonized. But what does it take really not to take those who depend on the, on, on the bus and anyway use it, it's rather those who have an option to switch them as well. And I think this is a great opportunity because, um, well, Paola, as, as she described it, she's Italian. Italian have, like Germans, so that brings us probably together. We have this passion for cars. You know, uh, it's still sick, but p German people wash their car by hand on a weekend. You still see that. Probably not in Italy, but in Italy, they talk about la bella macchina. So if, if you just force them, they'll find ways around it. And therefore, we have to put new values there. And what the industry I worked uh, and work still uh, all my life for, they did this nicely. They, they sold freedom. But is it freedom to stand in a traffic jam these days in most of the cities? Can I not find another freedom with other transport modes? And I think this is the opportunity. So, so looking on the one hand side, yes, the technology is mandatory to have the right product, maybe the right information, the right nudging tools to then change the behavior. Because if we just enforce by regulations or whatever you know that how easy it is the next government comes and says oh we don't agree and whoops the regulations are gone so we have to go much deeper and this is what we try to do together yeah so put that in i guess very practically what are the steps that are being taken together with venice um to to put that in place uh, paula talked about you know defining better the needs of the citizens so what what are the what are the steps that are are going to be taken or are being taken so currently, we already started in getting more details from the residents of Venice, because first, you have to understand your customer. So we started um, research uh, to go deeper, to drill in the problems, the issues, the expectations. Secondly, we started the challenge because we had invited at the beginning around the globe cities to join us. Uh, Venice was one of the winner. But now we are in the second phase. Uh, we are searching innovators. Innovators that come up with glorious ideas and said, I have the solution that was never trialed, that was never done before, that might address these issues, that we then can match up with the expectations from the citizens. This will be the second big phase. So we take quite some time until September 30th. We have still the challenge open for these great new ideas. It could be product. It could be uh, nudging technologies, various solutions. So, so we have no limitations for creative people to come up with new ideas. And then after September, we will sit together with our stakeholders that help us in, in organizing this, Challenge Works, the World Resource Institute, with the City of Venice, with external judges and ourselves to decide how we're addressing the needs of the residents with the solutions that came forward. And then as of 2026, we only start implementing, but we go through a process then by trialing it. And this is what we do. We're de-risking the problem for the city. Because if you are a city, you have taxpayers, and if you try to do something that was never trialed before, it's not an easy task. Because as a taxpayer might demand, oh, is it really working what you propose? That's sometimes questionable. This is where the Toyota Mobility Foundation is jumping in to de-risk this problem and say, okay, we're financing that. Let's try it. Because only while trying and doing it, we will find out what will help and what will address the issues. And on the long term, will change the behavior of residents and the people coming to visit or to work. Yeah, thanks for outlining that. I think it's a very practical approach and, and a good stepwise approach to, to this. So I guess the call is for, for innovators um, to, to put forth their ideas and put forth those solutions um, to, to really meet those challenges in Venice. So that's a good call to action to any innovators listening. Um, 
how also from the city side, because we have also a wide si- uh, base of listeners from cities. So I'm wondering how you envision, um, maybe Paula, you can start, how you envision the solutions developed in Venice also being applied and d- disseminated to other cities? Uh, yes, first uh, I would like to add what uh, Andy said, uh, that uh, for us, for the city of Venice, uh, we are looking for innovators, as Andy said, uh, for really a new uh, innovative solution, uh, something in addition to what we already did. And uh, uh, through this uh, uh, challenge, uh, like is uh, built this challenge, uh, for us is the opportunity to work with the private sector together, but uh, at the same time uh, achieving the uh, public policies. So this is a really a uh, public-private partnership for us uh, because Toyota is can can give a, a to the city of Venice, the opportunity to reach uh, maybe some um, markets, I have to say, that we don't reach as a city. Because if if we go on with the traditional wave, way of uh, selection um, like uh, uh, companies, uh, then we always come in to the same companies. So this is really what, what we look for is that working together with Toyota is uh, to find innovators, real innovators something that the city administration never see before. Okay. Uh, talking, uh, coming to the, these questions about uh, uh, what can be shared with other situation solution. As uh, uh, maybe I give some um, um, details that about the city of Venice. The city of Venice is, uh, as I said, included the mainland. That means the, the territory is very wide compared with the number of in- inhabitants. It's uh, for two thirds of the area water. So you can imagine, and in this water, you have the historical islands, many, many other islands that you have to reach every day to connect uh, uh, with uh, the mainland. And on the mainland, very variety of, of uh, uh, situation like the former petrochemical area, very big, one of the biggest ports uh, uh, in Europe, uh, and then uh, the third national airport. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this uh, all uh, bring together uh, different uh, conditions than other cities in the rest of Europe can have. So we have uh, tourist, uh, uh, over tourism, I have to say, unfortunately, to the, uh, to the mainland. Normal residents, uh, uh, yes, in total, the inhabitants of the city of Venice are uh, 260,000 and 170,000 live on the mainland. So you have to consider this uh, uh, this uh, situation. So this variety of solution, and uh, I, I have to say also the the environment in which uh, uh, the city of Venice uh, uh, is situated uh, it's very interesting for different cities in Europe. And this uh, I experimented with the activity of um, design project with other cities in partnership for the European cohesion policy in this uh, since uh, 2008 yeah thanks for thanks for outlining all of those things and and also painting us a picture of Venice um Andy how is the Toyota Mobility Foundation really planning to um take these lessons from those three cities and apply them to help other cities well, as Paola said, our focus is really to address the issue, and the issue is not only common to to Venice. Every major city uh, in Europe, and, and we have historical cities. Our cities are hundreds of years old. Venice is in a lucky position that they have still the beautiful island, and, and, and therefore a very special situation. But overall, it's the same. So if we build a modular system and... If it's technology, if you look at it, if it's a Google or something, it's applied in Venice or in Hamburg. It doesn't really matter. And this is what we look for. So so the visual implementation, the localization might be different in a different context, but the technology behind it, and this is what we want to help, because cities normally don't have, as uh, Baola clearly said, access um, to some of the startups, maybe access to capital. If we cover that, it's easier for cities then to implement what was already trialed, localize it, 
And we have many examples here in Germany, for example, where we worked with the foundation for a couple of years in, in the city of Trier that is now being carried over to the rural area in south of France. So this is already inherited in, in our way how we operate, that we are looking for solutions that are scalable, where we have open source solutions, hopefully, that many can benefit from it, and then localize it. And avoiding the big cost, what these days for every city is a major issue because no one is so rich that we can say, just change it. It's not working. And therefore, it needs this public-private partnership to really bring ideas forward. Totally agree with this approach, Uh, Baba. We're also really involved with this, uh, trying to figure out how to better bridge this public-private divide. So definitely on board with that. With you're with these uh, these initiatives and these steps that are happening in the next uh, several years. How will you really measure the success of them, and how will you, I guess, adapt to make sure that there is success over the coming years? Paula, you want to go first, or should I jump yeah, in? Yeah, <laughs> whoever wants to answer that one. <laughs> uh what what we want um, to uh, to obtain is a a long, a long lasting change in mindset on sustainable mobility so this will be the uh, um, the kpi that we wanted to uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, under control so it's uh, starting from this change of behavior and uh, then uh, we uh, we will measure of course as always the city does uh, with uh, many system of um, like a smart control room we want to measure the better air quality and uh the, safe, the urban space more safer, uh, some reducing the traffic, also the, the increase of the urban public spaces, uh, and, and then make the city more inclusive for all kinds of uh, uh, citizens. And, uh, and uh, this uh, collaboration co design together with the citizens uh, of the needs uh, and, so, and, and then the solution for sustainable transport modes yeah very good do you have something to add to that andy well i think as paula said kpis are uh, relatively easy to set when we know the expectations from the customers the residents first of all and we can measure it in a way then with the solution where we can set targets if we increase the amount of uh, bikes being shared uh, the users of public transport of the figures go up but I would be a little bit careful setting the expectations too high because behavioral change will take time. And Venice did a lot, but it didn't work. So we have to really look into realistic targets. And the realistic targets we have to develop with our partners. If there's... I give you an example, and it's something totally crazy now. Don't take that literal. It won't be one of the solutions. But if you have suddenly a shared vehicle where, as a good Italian, you get served an espresso while you get in in the morning, and you chauffeur driven, you have Wi Fi in there, and maybe this is something what Italians jump on and say, wow, I always wanted to have a driver, have a, a beautiful espresso while, while I'm being driven to, to my office with other people. I can enjoy a jet because Italian people are social, contrary to no offense against Germans, but we tend to be a little bit more closed up. So, so you know, there maybe you see a quick result. I don't know if that solution exists, and, but you see, it's these kind of things that might change behavior quicker because it reflects Italian kind of normal mm, connection uh, with society. But this will, the process show. So it's a little bit early to, at this stage to say um, how we will measure we will definitely measure because it's the toyota way we always promote is pdca so we're planning currently then we're doing it we're checking it and then we we draw our conclusions out of it and this is a process is always running so we're always setting targets because over the time period that we develop this project we have to adjust because 
I doubt that from the beginning on it will be perfect. I've never seen that in life. So, so there's always iterative process in developing. And this is what we're for. So, so we look for partners, innovators that have the same idea that come up and the process is built like that, that we have semifinalists, finalists coming up with the ideas and you're funding already the ideas to bring them to the next stage. And then at the end, we have hopefully the big bucks uh, for the implementation as of 2026 and then rolling it out in a successful way. I really hope that in a couple of years I talk to you and you say, oh, yeah, the, the chauffeur with the espresso is the thing that really, really worked. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that so much. Uh, if that was if that was the key to everything, all behavior change in, in Italy. <laughs> um, well, it- it was a quick shot, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is brilliant, right? You really have to appeal to people's uh, to the culture and to to everything to get any kind of behavior change. So you really have to be creative and explore every avenue. So I, I like that approach also. Um, so for those who are listening today, you outline for innovators, for companies, for innovators, people who have ideas. What are the next steps for getting involved? Well, if you're an innovator, you should start looking in our uh, webpage, uh, the sustainablecitieschallenge.org. There you find all the information because time is limited. We have only till the 30th of September to receive your idea that is hopefully innovative and beyond my idea with a coffee. Um, so uh, we expect uh, from the technology side, uh, whatever you deem to change behavior, and as we outlined before, we think it takes multiple solutions to bring together to really reach our targets. And then we will be able also to answer your questions because you have also a button there where you can arrange uh, one-to-one with our colleagues to uh, to explain you a little bit more about the challenge, what we expect, how we measure, uh, then also the ideas that will be brought forward. And beginning of next year, we have the selection of the winning ideas with our colleagues from Venice to really move forward and start then a little bit later, the implementation of the first ideas, the trialing, the development, or whatever. Yeah, brilliant. And for any other listeners, do you also have a call to action? Um, anything that they should do to get involved? Well, everyone can start at home, I think, because we do this challenge with Venice. Mm-hmm. I think behavioral change starts with you yourself. Think about how you can reduce maybe your daily trip with a car. Uh, using a bicycle follow us because we will have also information on our web page uh, on the stories that emerge out of these projects and learn from it because it's one project the issues we have are global the issues are big and we have to start in small steps everywhere and i think if you see already ideas so also other cities if you say wow we 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 are interested in that Drop us an email um, at the Toyota Mobility Foundation. Our contacts are given. And stay in touch with us. We are happy to share. We want to involve as many as possible people in this process because the challenges are everywhere the same. Changing a behavior that we have learned over the last maybe 30, 40 years that caused us in this trouble. And this we have to revert back to a more normal and helping cities to breathe again for better air quality, for better quality of life, and for the freedom that the car once gave us, which today is much more a little bit, well, a prison. Because sitting in a traffic jam, I don't consider, even if it's the most beautiful city in the world, uh, is what you want. Definitely not on my end. Um, now, I'd like to ask you because um, I'm definitely, you know, not totally comprehensive in my questions. So I'd like to give you also the chance to have a little bit of an open floor in case there's anything that you think we really missed talking about, something that's really important to to talk about, uh, to tell our listeners about. Um, Paula, do you have anything in mind that, oh, we they, they really need to know about this? <laughs> Yes, yes. Shorty, I want uh, to say to the one that, uh, the innovators that want to apply that be 
creative and brave. <laughs> we want a really new solution. So try, uh, as uh, Andy said, uh, we have a lasting like uh, 40 days almost. And uh, we, don't not, we don't need a new, a new uh, infrastructure or services. Uh, we want to uh, reach behavior change uh, through uh, nudging and uh, uh, um, needs uh, analysis. Uh, yeah, so creative and brave. Be creative and brave. Yes. And um, just as a note for for our listeners, uh, we'll be releasing this a little bit later, of course, in September already. So please act fast um, and and get on that that challenge. So, um, Andy, did you have anything that we didn't get the chance to talk about yet? I think we pretty much touched on everything. But one question I always ask myself, be, being a German as well, and, and the Italian have such a love for the car as well. This is one question I really ask myself a long time. Is As I'm a little bit older already, is the next generation of Italians ready for model shift? Because changing old behavior is more difficult. But maybe the young generation, I have always hope. Hope is the, these days anyway a big word. So, uh, Paola, what do you think? Uh, is there hope for the Italian uh, next generation for model shift, despite all the beautiful car brands I don't want to name here that you have, uh, which get everyone, at least at my age, still excited about? Uh, yes, we discussed already about this. I think uh, something has changed. Uh, it's changed. So we notice when we go um, to school uh, with initiatives, but also to the teenagers now, that if you ask them uh, if they wanted to take the driving license when we'll be 18 uh, or to have a car, they are not like we were, I and you, and the, almost the same age. They, they don't consider uh, the car like the first, um, the, the priority for them and uh, I noticed uh, especially when I travel uh, all, uh, all around Europe uh, for work in the city so many young people uh, biking uh, uh, teenagers instead of driving a car um, I think uh, uh, it's changing also in Italy yeah, I definitely see that trend happening. Just young people being more conscious of the decisions and the future that they really want in the city. So we're yeah, hoping that that uh, is embraced by all generations. Um, so now we move on to our fun segment. Um, and our segment this for today is called Flip the Script. Flip the Script. You are the one asking the questions and I'll be the one answering them. So it's when you get to ask each other questions. Um, so I'm kind of out of the equation now. You get to do my job for me. Um, Paula, do you have a question that you want to ask Andy? <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, now, Andy, that you, uh, you start, you, you, you better know, uh, the environment and our policies in Venice. You came uh, more than one time. And, uh, are you ready and especially thrilled uh, to, to complete, uh, to achieve the challenge together with us? Uh, um, they come back again to, to our nations. As a German, basically, Italy was the first country we invaded uh, when the economy was doing better. And since that, I have a very strong relationship with Italy. So I spent many, many years for vacation in Italy. Seeing your commitment, seeing the dedication that the administration of Venice is putting into this project, I'm more and more convinced that we will reach something. And what we discussed before, that also the Italian next generation is a generation far beyond my age that, that has still this affection to, to vehicles and, and sees it in a different way. Yes, I'm convinced uh, we will reach the target and move forward. Very good. Um, I hope you're happy with that answer, Paula. <laughs> good <luck. Yes. laughs> good. Um, Andy, do you have a question uh, for Paola? Well, I asked already one question earlier on, on, on Italian youth, but maybe second one, because that came doing, the idea just popped up. What would you think about an espresso in the morning in your public transport? Maybe we just have to <laughs> to include an uh, espresso machine and people would be more happy to go uh, on the bus, on the train, because, you know, it's part of the culture. 
Yeah, I was thinking now in the Vaporetto. It's the best. You cross the Grand Canal uh, with the Vaporetto in the middle of uh, the center of Venice and you have uh, a coffee. Could be nice. I can suggest it to our public company running the um, local public transportation. Now, m- maybe I should apply then for maybe I'm one of the innovators. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> you should apply. When you know about um, uh, smart, the concept of smart city, I was impressed when I was studying in Rotterdam. The smart city is considered also if, for example, if you have some gardens for elderly people and you, re- uh, you realize in the middle of this area a space where they can have a couple, a cup of coffee or tea together, this is smart city. So, Perfect also for uh, the transportation. Yeah, lovely. Um, And then we get to the final question. I think you actually already started answering it a little bit, Paola, on what a smart city is to you. Maybe you want to elaborate a bit on that thought on what what is a smart city to you? Uh, Smart city is uh, uh, to make uh, our uh, cities uh, uh, more livable or uh, increase the quality of living in the city. And smart city, of course, uh, is there is a definition that starts from analyzing data. The data is uh, uh, the input that we need in order to make uh, uh, the policies in order to improve the quality of life in the city. So smart city is uh, for sure starting from data, but as to in include uh, what we call uh, social innovation uh, so means inclusion for the different target of people uh, fragile uh, elderly young people uh, and uh, has to be something that has to last uh, longer like uh, linking to sustainability to resilience um, and uh, yeah to have a, a cup of coffee together <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, very important we keep on coming back to the espresso somehow you know <laughs> um no i love it uh, and th- it's a question we ask every single guest right and so it's really interesting to hear the different cultural aspects and the different perspectives on this question so i, I love that as well um andy bring bring us your perspective what is a smart city to you well, smart city has many factors, but it's probably not surbi- surprising when you have the name Toyota Mobility Foundation that I talk about mobility. And for me, uh, a smart city is where an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable mobility offer is allowing residents and visitors to reach their destinations without owning a private car. Very good. Yeah, very uh, concrete. I love it. Uh, With that, we're all finished. It's really been a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you for sharing your insights. All I've gotten to learn more about Venice. I'm really craving a coffee now. So thank you so much for for all of your insights. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks a lot and a pleasure to join today. Yes, thanks a lot. It was a really nice chat together. Yeah, thank you. And to all of our listeners, all the innovators, first off, uh, if you have a solution that can inspire people to embrace low and zero carbon transport options, and again, be brave and creative, as Paola said, uh, don't miss the opportunity to participate in the Sustainable Cities Challenge. um, And make sure to do that before September 30th. Um, and of course, to all of our listeners, don't forget, you can always create a free account on babble-smartcities.eu. You can find out more about smart city projects, initiatives like this one, solutions, implementations, everything's there. So thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you at the next stop on the journey to a better urban life.